Good evening, everybody. Um, just wanted to uh, start off by saying you know, I'm thankful that uh, we have this opportunity to uh, speak to you guys tonight, and uh, hopefully uh, when we're finished, it, uh, you can come away with uh, something that will help your marriage. Uh, I just wanted to point out something. How many of you heard about you know opposites attracting? You know, I'm, I'm sure you've heard that, right? Yes. Well, we're, we're a good example. If you could stand out there. This, this shirt Use really depicts my personality. You see it's square box, everything's organized inside. You can read it. That's me. I like things organized. I like things in the box. Hers is going in a circle because her life is always going in circles. You know? Except tell, when I fall down. You can't, you can't tell when one word starts and the other word ends, you know. So that's kind of like our personality. That's who, that's who we are. Uh, I know most of you know us, but uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, we met in high school in the ninth grade. Uh, we started dating in the tenth grade. Uh, we married in 1971, so we've been married um, a little over 47 years now. Uh, we have uh, two grown children who are not disciples yet. Uh, we became disciples in 1999. And we uh, were married at that time for 28 years, and that was uh, only by God's grace that we were together that long, so uh, not being disciples. And I, I once read that, you know, experience comes from making mistakes. And if that's true, we're not only the longest married couple here, but we're probably the most experienced. So if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and there, there's a song by uh, one of my favorite groups called Mercy Me. And they have a song out called Younger Me. I don't know if any of you heard it or not. But there's a, there's a verse in there that says, if I could tell you everything I've learned so far, then you could be one step ahead. So tonight, we're, we're hoping that we can put you guys one step ahead by sharing with you uh, some information that we've learned through our 47 years of marriage. And, uh, you know, we need to learn to adapt to the changing seasons or stages of marriage uh, in order for our marriages to be all God wants for us and as individuals and as married couples. Marriage relationships are constantly changing. Attitudes shift, emotions fluctuate, spouses' treatment of each other ebbs and flows uh, between loving and not so loving. And may always, you may not always like each other but you should always love each other. And I don't know how many of you realize it or not, but when you took your wedding vows, this is basically what you were saying. I don't know how many, can you read that? It says forever and for always, no matter what. And that's, that's what God intends for your marriage. That's what marriage needs to be about. I would like to start off with a little disclaimer. Just because we're facilitating uh, this lesson tonight doesn't mean we always get it right in our own marriage. You know, it's, it's always a work in progress. You need to understand that. And as I was saying before, uh, we're going to talk about the different seasons of marriage. Do you want to add anything? What? Oh. Uh, um, you should have gotten one ticket per couple we're being handed out. At the end, uh, we're going to have a drawing for those that are, that are here, and uh, you'll get this sign to take home with you. We have one at home, and uh, we have it posted above our bedroom door because uh, the bedroom for us is, is our sanctuary. Amen. That's where no fighting takes place. That's, you know, so. <laughs> that's, uh, so. We got this sign, and somebody's going to take this one home with them tonight. Sorry, I know better, but I can't help myself. You know me. Um, I just wanted to add that, yes, we met in the ninth grade because two high schools were brought together into one, and the communities fought like crazy. And uh, you would not believe the number of couples that came out of that school pairing up that would have never met, even though those towns were only 15 minutes apart. 
But um, I just want to say we, we started out as friends, as classmates, then as friends, and then it became more. And uh, once I decided I wanted him in the 10th grade, he had no chance. <laughs> So our, where we're going to start, is as we go through the different uh, stages or seasons of marriage, we know through this diverse group that some of you are going to be in different places than others, but we're, we're going to start obviously with the spring season, that's uh, in Proverbs 15, uh, Proverbs 5, 18, it talks about, may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. And uh, so, you know, we're going to talk about the early, early years of your marriage. When love is in bloom, the marriage is fresh, blossoming, and survival is not a word that comes to mind. Instead, marriage is a place in which we get to live out God's many commands for serving, accepting, encouraging, forgiving, and submitting to one another. And that's, that's what marriage is all about. You know, in, the, in this uh, spring season, everything is good. You're working together to make your marriage thrive. You grow and grow for the glory of God. Proverbs 18.22 tells us that whoever finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. And that's what we need to keep in mind throughout our marriage, you know. Uh, at this stage, it's a glorious minefield as you learn to transition from me to we. This is not as easy as it sounds. The choices you make day to day will impact your marriage at this stage throughout the rest of your marriage. You have to keep that in mind because before you were living as, as an individual, as, as me, and now you've come together and you're now we. Um, there are new roles to learn. You know, the, the husband has to, uh, the male has to learn how to be a husband and a leader how to be a, and a, wife, uh, a wife and a helper. And this can put extra stress on the relationship. It's important to you work on your roles and that you uh, work uh, together using your individual strengths to make the marriage better. Because each of you bring a different strength to the marriage. And you need to identify that and use that uh, for, the, uh, for the good of the marriage. Uh, this is the season in which you want to work on love and respect for each other and learning what uh, each spouse needs. You know, you, you want to get others involved in your marriage, especially being married here in the church. You want to get other married couples involved in your marriage and help you uh, throughout this stage. And there are some very valuable lessons to learn in these early days of marriage. First of all, you, uh, about finances. As before, you were responsible for your own stuff. Now you're together as a couple. You know, you need to share responsibilities for uh, your finances. You know, one or both of you may bring debt into the marriage, from college loans and things like that. You know, you need to learn how to work through those situations. Uh, you know, it's a shared responsibility. We've always believed that there should be one bank account and one spending plan. I don't like to use the term budget because that's kind of negative sounding, but if you have a spending plan, people like to spend. You know? <laughs> so that makes it easier to put together. Um, for husbands, early on in the marriage, there are two important dates that you need to remember. Number one is your spouse's birthday. Good date. <laughs> and number two, your wedding anniversary. You know, and a little tip, for either one of these dates, you don't give household gifts. You don't give mixers, you don't give blenders, you don't give toasters, okay? The car would be okay. Just, yeah, just don't do that, okay? Um, also, uh, a little, another little tip for the husbands. Um, I found it, it works well to, to give flowers at times, just give them randomly. You know, no pattern, give them unexpectedly with no expectations in return. I don't like to set a pattern with giving them because then when you, you say you do it the second Friday of every month and you forget one time, <laughs> you're in trouble, okay? 
just do it randomly. Don't, don't set a pattern, and it becomes totally unexpected. And again, you, you do it with no expectations in return, but after a while, who knows what unexpected rewards may come your way. <laughs> also, when things are going well in this early stages of marriage, you need to realize that your marriage is a work in progress, which means you need to continue to work on it throughout every stage, every season. Because once you think you are finished working on your marriage, your marriage will be finished. A little um, story about the flower thing. We used to get flowers a lot before we got married. Um, later on, it was, it was so unexpected that when he came home with flowers, occasionally my children would ask if somebody at the hospital died before they got their flowers. Wow. That embarrassed him into bringing them more often. Okay, and, and some of you would say, what did you do? But we're not going there. Okay, now I'll get back to my list. In the spring of marriage, the, one of the first things that's really important um, is to let go of selfish expectations. We all come into that marriage thinking that uh, we are the most important thing to our spouse and we expect them to meet our every need. And um, if we keep expecting that, we are going to be very disappointed and bitter. Um, so it's really important that we get a realistic view of what, uh, what we can expect and what's fair to expect. Um, accept your spouse's slightly annoying habits, such as, I'll take some of the popular ones, clothes on the floor or the toilet seat up or, you know, things like that. But everybody has their little quirks and um, the things that were cute before you got married sometimes aren't so cute afterwards, um, and yet they don't need to become a big deal. So just accept some of those things. Learn your spouse's life, love language and focus on filling that need regularly. And if you've ever read the love languages, you know that's words of aff affirmation, excuse me, acts of service, quality time, and physical touch. It's different for everybody. It's important that you figure out what your spouse needs so that you can meet their needs and then they'll meet yours. Um, work on agreement about each other's role in the marriage. Um, it doesn't matter if you're both working 40 hours a week. Um, you're gonna have to come to some decisions about who's gonna do the laundry, who's gonna do the bills, who's gonna cook, who's gonna vacuum, who's gonna clean toilets, and uh, there'll be more decisions later. You gotta figure that out early on, and, and you know, don't just assume that it's the wife's role or the husband's role. <coughs> Women can take trash out, too, okay? Um, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> uh, work on the sa sexual satisfaction for both the husband and the wife um, and find lots of ways to have fun together. Um, there are, you know, things that you're used to doing together that can be fun, but um, try and find fun in what each other appreciates. Um, in, um, with Wayne, it was softball, and uh, I learned how to keep the scorebook, uh, babysit the kids, all the kids that were there, and um, do some other things, feed the team at the same time. So, um, and that kept us together. I mean, he was gonna be gone, so I was gonna be with him. Uh, so you need to find things to do together that you enjoy, um, and Beck, Back to the sexual part, if you guys please your wives first, they will please you. Amen. Ask this man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Avoid excessive separate interests and agree on what limits are acceptable. Now, we all know that the picture of the husband in front of the TV watching football all day on Saturday and Sunday and the woman pacing in front of the TV who won't get out of the way except during commercials. 
<laughs> but, um, it, you know, we can't let those things become an issue and separate us. So we sort of have to find limits on what is um, acceptable. And I know that when we were dating, yes, I was very young. I didn't have very many options. I learned how to do needlepoint so that I could sit beside him while he watched football. So I'm um, not suggesting that you women need to do that. I'm just saying you've, you all have to figure out some limitations for the things. And uh, the women are known to have girlfriend lunches and love to go shopping together, and there need to be limits to that too. So you all have to work that out. And if you don't know, the book boundaries will help you with that. Um, praying together is very important. Pray for each other. And here's one you may not have heard. Practice the serenity prayer. And this is the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot, con cannot control. Courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Now this I learned at one of those 12 step programs but it really saved me from a lot of marital problems and has helped me with many things since. If you just internalize that and remember, hey, I can't control that, so I need to let it go. Um, and this will, will help you uh, to really make a difference in your marriage too. Change yourself, don't nag your husband, your spouse about changing. Your focus, as always, needs to be God, then the spouse, then work, and then yourself. Remember, yourself came to the end of that list. Okay. Establishing discipling partnerships with mature married couples and getting help with persistent issues. Um, I can tell you that even today, I could very easily end up calling somebody and saying, we need a referee because there are times you're gonna to get to things where you're just not gonna agree, you're gonna keep button heads, and that's where you really have to get some help. And you need to get some spiritual help. Lastly, in my group, commit to building healthy lifestyles, eating, exercise, and weight. And this is something that I added to this because of my experiences this year. <laughs> Let's just say healthy, being healthy is on my mind right now. But the point is that even when you first start out, you really need to pay attention to being healthy. Having healthy weight, eating healthy, exercising, and all that stuff is going to be even more important later on. But the earlier you start, the better. This is a good specimen right here. Man has played sports and stayed healthy all his life. Now, I have fed him, though. But as you can see, the eating didn't make a difference for me. <laughs> it's the other things that also helped. And I will say one other thing. Fast food is not healthy eating. So now we, we progress into the... Um, summer season of our marriage and in psalms 128 verse 3 it says wife is like a fruitful vine and the children like olive shoots at this at this stage we have hopefully made it past the adjustment times together as you worked on how to be we with you and you both are still emotionally intact and you want to enjoy the best of what marriage has to offer but now new challenges are on the way we have been married a few years and most likely are ready to start a family or already have children on the way. At this stage, you now need to learn how to be a family as the husband learns to be a father and the wife is taking on a new role as mother. You know, you need to work on your values as a couple and what you want to instill in your children before the first one arrives. And in Proverbs 26, a 20 verse 6, it says, Start your children on the way they should go, and when they get older, you will not turn from it. And I think uh, Scott and Dion did a great lesson 
on parenting on that, on that point about the connection, direction, and correction. And uh, unfortunately, um, you know, we were not disciples at the time when our children were young, so we, we did what we thought was right, but, you know, looking back now, I really wish we could have changed things. But you guys, you have an opportunity, being members uh, of the church and being disciples, not to make the same mistakes that we made with your children. Um, you know, uh, so I'm just, just encouraging you to work on that, that phase of it. Now you have um, new, new bumps that may occur between the spouse, uh, you know, because now you've got children on the way, you've got to make decisions about, you know, does mom stay home uh, for the children or do they go back to work if they were working before? Um, raising children put a demand on your time. Uh, there's different ideas on discipline for the children. And again, I, I think Scott and Dion did a good job uh, with that, with their uh, class, you know, on, on connections and uh, things. So these are the things you got to think about you need to work through. So go back, you know, look through your notes on that class. But I think there's some excellent points they brought out that I wish we had learned before, you know. And being a big, being a new parent is a big responsibility that God has entrusted you with. And uh, you need to take that seriously. Husbands, at this stage, you may feel that you are not important or forgotten because the children are getting more of your wife's attention. And uh, this is just the, the mother's nature. It's just the way they are. And uh, you just have to understand that but at the same time, I think uh, Scott and, and Dion made a, a great point about not letting the children come between you. You still need to have your time together, you know. Um, and we need, to, we need to be like the husband that's uh, mentioned in Proverbs 31 in verses 11 and 28. He has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. You know, um, I'm sure most of you realize this, but you know, being a mom and taking care of kids is a big responsibility. It's a hard job. And I'm sure most of you have seen this T-shirt. It says, I'm a mom. What's your superpower? You know, so it's it's important responsibility. Um, and uh, husbands, you're going to be able to do this very easily because your wife is going to be like the Proverbs 31 wife of noble character. So uh, you need to uh, treat each other in that respect. Um, even in times that your wife is not like that, you need to remember that in Colossians 3.19, it tells us, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And this is important because they're going through changes as well. Their body's changing, uh, you know, they're trying to take care of the kids, they have less energy with all this going on, and they are always, always doing what they think is best for the family. You know, uh, I, many, many times, you know, when Cherry was uh, raising the kids and I was working full time, and early on, uh, you know, not only was I working full time, but I was going to school four nights a week to get my degree. And so, you know, a lot of that fell on her, and I just had to understand and respect that. And, um, you know, uh, it's just important that you do that. There's also, husbands, um, a third important date that comes into play now, and that's Mother's Day, okay? And um, hopefully you remember the other two I told you earlier. Again, this is not an, um, an occasion to give household gifts, okay? Mother's Day, don't do it. Now, Wayne's wisdom about Mother's Day was gained on my first Mother's Day when I was expecting the first child. And we had our biggest fight yet because he didn't consider me a mother yet. Oh. 
<laughs> so, ever since 47 years ago that we had that huge fight, he has been approaching men with women who are having their first child to tell them, this Mother's Day counts, don't screw it up. <laughs> true? True. Okay. But you guys remember, you know, like in 71, Hallmark didn't have the Mother's to Be card. That's true. <laughs> now they do. Well, see, I, I informed them too. Okay. So, just, just a little ad-lib there to let you know where Wayne gets some of his brilliance. <laughs> and just like he told you before, it, it comes from the mistakes we've made. Um, okay, so now you're ready to have kids, and my first comment is having kids is not for sissies. <laughs> um, a whole new focus and many, many adjustments. Much to agree on. Discipline, education, and yes, you're, you're just having a baby. You don't think you got to think about these things, but now's when you think about how are you going to discipline? What are your expectations um, on behavior, education? Are you going to do sports or not? I, you wouldn't believe how many parents get to that age where the kids are ready to have play sports, and one thinks, no, I don't want my baby getting hurt, and the other one thinks they should go out for football. So, um, you know, you have to come to some conclusions about these things. Other extracurricular activities, whether or not you're hoping they're going to go to college, and if you are, you better start saving before you have the baby. Kids need boundaries, too. And this is an ever-changing target. So all those decisions, yes, you start talking about them before you have the kid, but that, that discussion just keeps on evolving as you go because life ch keeps changing the target. Um, and yes, the kids do need boundaries. And uh, so um, now my kids were 70 kids, but we did not believe in no discipline. In fact, we were very discipline oriented. So uh, for those of you who hear stories about parents that grew up with never getting spanked or never getting disciplined. I don't know those people, and my kids are not them. So um, I do believe in discipline, and if anybody comes to my house to babysat, they know I believe in discipline. So <laughs> the Christian example is crucial during these years. Focus on God, spouse, children, work, and then self. Um, dis discipling partnerships, again, with mature Christian parents and daily prayer together, continuing to give the kids the right um, uh, focus uh, on God uh, is important. And also to continue your commitment to a healthy lifestyle. We really are setting the stage for our children when we start that right from the beginning, uh, making sure that our kids learn what healthy eating is and what all these other things are too that are important for, for their health and for their welfare. How they eat, exercise and all that stuff is just as important. Thanks. Now we transition into uh, what I call the fall season. We've been married a number of years now, and the children are growing up. Most likely now you have teenagers, and that's a challenge all in itself. But uh, in Ephesians 6.4, it tells us, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And um, if you're in that stage with you, with you got teenagers, you have to remember that, you know, you don't want to things, do things that push their buttons, and uh, you don't want them pushing your buttons. You, know? and you need to discover a more Christ-like way to relate to them. And again, I, I got to refer back to Scott and Dion's lesson on parenting because I, I thought they gave us some very good examples to follow there uh, with that. And um, as new, uh, new challenges start to appear, um, how to allocate your time and energy around careers, 
each other's needs, children's activities, social, uh, social activities, church activities, uh, aging pa parents, and then just time for the two of you. You know, you may find yourself stuck between raising children and caring for parents that have become aging at that point. You know, you, you may not actually be caring for the parents, but you're distracted by their health and well-being issues, and you're arranging for their care and making sure that they're okay. You know, we found ourselves uh, in this stage uh, several times uh, throughout, throughout our lives with, you know, with different family members, and it, it was, it's just very challenging. Uh, and these things can put added pressure and stress on a marriage. And as disciples, we think about Ephesians 6, uh, verses 2 through 3, where it says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on earth. And we feel compelled to do what is best to help our parents when, when their health starts failing and uh, they may not be in the best uh, uh, shape. But I encourage you to discuss this as a couple, okay? Right. Don't either one of you make this decision by yourself. You must be in agreement with whatever course of action you take for the aging parents because this can be a, a big stressor in your marriage. Uh, if it's decided that one spouse is going to be a caregiver for a parent, the other spouse needs to be supportive and always talk about what the parent's needs are and what the caregiver's needs are, okay? If you're not the caregiver, you, you may not see the full picture, but you need, to, you need to know what the caregiver is going through and what, uh, what you can do to help if you're not that spouse uh, providing the care. Hopefully that makes sense. So as we get closer to our stage of life, we got more to share. <laughs> uh, so when your kids are in middle school or their teens or above, as a, um, Wayne says, it's really challenging to be a parent during those times. Um, we're battling for control and they're battling for independence. And um, again, I think the word boundaries comes to mind. And um, do remember quite a few of those boundaries my daughter and, all, and I fought over. Um, but eventually she got the message uh, and she became um, really, um, I can't think of the word I wanted, but she became a, a little Wayne because <laughs> she, she was, um, she was super um, independent and she was trustworthy and she went away to college. She told other college kids that were doing stupid things that they were doing stupid things. So um, I guess I have to give that to him in the genes because uh, we fought like cats and dogs. But um, it is tough because you're trying to protect them, trying to teach them in best way to go you're trying to keep them from all the crazy stuff that's out there in the world and at the same time they want their independence um, and I guess I didn't even write this down but one thing I remember is um, you give them you trust you give them your trust until they break it and when they break it then they have to re-earn it and as long as they understand that um, it's they're going to think twice about breaking that trust the second time around. So um, stick to your guns, parents. Um, make those tough decisions and stick by them. Um, <clears throat> prioritizing time between work, family time, children's activities, and time with your spouse really gets tough. Um, and I know we also have church on top of that. So um, it is very difficult, and you have to learn to say no. You have to say no to some of the activities they want to do. You have to say no to some of the activities you want to do. And um, you just have to figure out what is most important. Other challenges include personal health problems and dealing with those of aging parents, like Wayne mentioned, the sandwich generation. 
Um, if you haven't taken care of your health or you're clumsy like me, you may find yourself dealing with a lot of health problems at this stage and sometimes before that. Um, and if you're having to take care of parents, it is super stressful. And I have to tell you that get mental health help if you need it because um, caring for parents took me down and it took me down for a long time. And Wayne didn't know what to do with me. So, <laughs> so you have to make sure you take care of yourself um, at the same time. And the decisions, as Wayne said, they need to be made jointly because you need the support of your spouse um, when you're working with a parent or even a child that's uh, having health problems. Changing life goals. As I said before, all of our goals, the plans we have, they're gonna change as we go forward because our situations change. Decisions are being made about college and preparing for retirement during this time. If you haven't already started that, which probably I should have probably put that in the spring section because you should always be preparing either for college and retirement. Um, even if you're only putting away five bucks a week or something out of your paycheck. That's something that we're lear learning a little late. Um, here's a biggie, and I, I'm going to say this loud and clear. Do not spend your retirement savings on your kids. And I will say it again. Don't do it. It's bad. Okay. Don't, don't send your, don't pay for your kids' college or their weddings or their houses or anything out of your retirement funds. If you want to pay for that $35,000 wedding, which I heard is what it costs now in Maryland, either save up for it, buy a loan, get a loan, or make a deal with your kid. Hand them a check and say, this is all you got, you figure it out. That's what we told our daughter we were going to do. Um, save up for those things, take out loans, but you can't replace those ret re retirement savings, so don't do that. Don't bail your parents out either. Um, sometimes, we, sometimes we do, but don't use your retirement funds. Focus again, God, spouse, family, and work. That never changes. Continue to have mature Christian parents as your discipling partners people who've been where you're headed, and continue your commitment for a healthy lifestyle. Thanks. Yeah, as she, as she mentioned about, you know, your retirement savings and, and using it for other things, uh, the children can, you know, get student loans and things because they'll have more time to pay those back than you will have to replace your retirement savings. So you just have to be aware of that. Now we transition into what we call the winter season of marriage. You've been married a number of years now. In fact, you're starting to celebrate milestone anniversaries. And it's important that you make these celebrations special because most marriages don't make it that long. And uh, the children are starting to leave the nest or have already left. So empty nesters, that can be exciting times as well. And then you've got grandchildren coming, that's, that's exciting. Uh, you know, you have that to look forward to. Uh, but then there's also challenges during this uh, time of, of marriage. You know, you may have a spouse that needs caregiving, a spouse that's unhealthy. Uh, we, we, <laughs> Exhibit A. We feel compelled to do this. And <laughs> We feel compelled to do this, but you may not be able to. You know, the other spouse may not be healthy enough themselves, or they may still be working, or they just don't know what to do. So this could be a challenging time that you need to work through. And caregiving of a spouse requires patience and understanding on both people's parts. Because the caregiver may be trying to do tasks that they don't normally do, and the unhealthy spouse can't really help, but you need to, if you're in that situation, 
you need to ask for input. You need to humble yourself and ask the other spouse, how do you do this? How would you cook that? How would you, you know, wash this? You just have to do it. And it's, uh, it's an important thing to, when you're caregiving. And then the spouse that's receiving the care, they kind of have to humble themselves as well and understand that you're doing the best you can. And even though a certain task or something may not turn out the way you normally would do it, just accept it, okay? And, um, and if you go through those things together, the caregiving works out. But it's gonna take patience and understanding on both spouses' part when you reach that stage. And it's important that, that you work through these things together. Yeah, this is the part I know the most about. I did a lot of caregiving and it was very frustrating and it was very debilitating, but it's even harder to be the person that ha somebody else has to care for, um, in my opinion, for me. For me, it's hard. Women are used to doing everything or being able to do everything. And so to be in a situation where you can't do anything, hardly at all, um, is very difficult. And um, it's so hard on the spouse because they're used to, okay, it's six o'clock. Why didn't you jump out of bed and fix my breakfast while I get my shower? Why? Why aren't you kissing me at the door as I leave? Why aren't I leaving for work? Because you have to stay home and take care of me. So um, luckily Wayne had plenty of time to take off and I did have caregivers when I needed them. But um, it is very difficult because you have to take on the role of everybody. And um, anybody who's ever um, been if you're a single mom, you know about having to take on the role of everything, but it's still different because you had somebody caring for those things and then all of a sudden there's nobody. So if you have a spouse and you lost your spouse, it's sort of kind of like that, only you still have to get up and take care of the other person. So it is very difficult. <coughs> it is very frustrating um, for both parties. and. Um, when you think about um, if you would write out a recipe for how you do, how you separate the laundry, how, you, how much detergent to put in, what temperature the water needs to be, and how to fold, forget how to fold it, okay? <laughs> how to hang it up and all that other stuff. I mean, Wayne felt like he was, we were writing a book. Um, and then it comes to cooking and, um, I'm not sure, I'm sure he boiled eggs at some point. <laughs> and he does know how to boil water. But um, learning how to cook meals, even just heat up meals that were brought to our house was something new to him. So, um, and now thanks to this arm, he has to cut my meat and dip things out and you know help me bathe and all that other kind of stuff. So. These things can happen at any time in your marriage, but they're much more likely to happen as you get older and things, crazy things can happen. Sometimes they're your fault, sometimes they're not. And even when they are your fault, you need the spouse to be understanding and loving. So this is where the love and respect things. My respect for him has grown tenfold since January when I fell and broke my kneecap and crushed my wrist. Um, and his compassion, his compassionate side has appeared out of nowhere <laughs> during that time. And I'm sorry, I'm being silly, but that's how it felt, okay? Um, so, to the winner, celebrating the milestones is great. For our 25th anniversary, I had always wanted to go to Hawaii. We were planning a trip to Hawaii, and he, out of the blue, suggests that we renew our marriage vows in Hawaii in front of waterfalls. 
man, was that a neat idea. And everybody that he knew, women-wise, thought he was the greatest husband in the world. The men were not happy with him. <laughs> but it was wonderful, and it was a great, it was a great idea. Um, since then, we renewed our vows here at church. I think that was our 47th? 40, no, it wasn't 45th. I don't know. Maybe it was. Um, at any rate, um, you celebrate those things. You make a big deal out of them. Um, at this point, hopefully your kids are grown and in college, finished college on their own. You might have an empty nest or the kids might be moving back home. If the kids are moving back home, God help you. <laughs> Double up on your prayer and your discipling and get a contract. <laughs> make them sign it, make them pay, make them work, make it uncomfortable, <laughs> close down the second bathroom, whatever you got to do to make it so they want to leave. <laughs> Take my word for it, it's the best thing. Because you don't want to have to evict them later. If you make them too comfortable, you might have to evict them. Um, I already said weddings and grandchildren don't spend your retirement savings on them. And I do know that some people end up having to raise their grandchildren, and it's a horrible thing that this world has caused that um, to be a situation. We're not talking about that. Uh, at some point, children need to be responsible for their own lives. We have to quit bailing them out. Start while they're in college. Start while they're in high school. Whatever. We have to quit bailing them out. So don't bail them out. Make them stand on their own two feet. Let them feel the consequences of their mistakes, just like we did. And you will never regret that. That's why I have a daughter who would never ask for a dime, no matter where she was, what situation she was in, she'd figure it out. I have a son on the other end of the spectrum, but we had him evicted. So, <laughs> there's a story behind it. I won't go there. But at any rate, you want your kids to grow up and take care of themselves because at some point, you're going to need maybe their help, but you also don't want to be a burden on them either. So plan ahead for those things. Retirement decisions, we're in that situation now. We've got to figure it out. Where are we going? Are we going to have enough money? How are we going to do it? And we go back and forth. That's going to change as we go into retirement. But we got the savings. We didn't spend it on the kids. You heard that, right? Okay. You have to deal with failing health, caregiving, disappointments. If I haven't said it before, we all know that there are a lot of disappointments in this life and we can't let them knock us off, off our wheels. We have to keep going. And that's why we have God. We also have the death of parents to deal with, spouses, and unfortunately, children. And depression is something that comes in there with a whole lot of those things. And so if you're lucky enough to still have a spouse, lean on them, get help. Get them to help you um, and help them. Uh, the whole point is we have, we're in this together. and God put us together for a reason. And I'm so glad that God put me together with him in the ninth grade. But I didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> All I had to do was fight off those other four women. That one. <laughs> well, they were just girls then. <laughs> Wasn't that tough? Um, finally, your focus always has to be God, spouse. Now it's finances before family. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, just to wrap up here, um, if, if you take nothing else away from this, what, what I'm going to tell you now is what we've learned um, since becoming disciples, uh, four key things to building a strong, lasting, 
loving marriage. The first is Christ. You know, it needs to be the focus of your marriage. Because marriage is God's plan. Marriage, God is what put us together. So you need to be focused, you need to have both spouses focused on their relationship with Christ, with God. The second is commitment. You know, um, you're gonna, you're gonna need to be committed to your marriage, just like the sign says. And um, there's, a, there's a song, it's called The Rest of Mine, and it has a verse in there that says, I can't swear I'll be here for the rest of your life, but I swear that I'll love you for the rest of mine. And so that's the type of commitment you gotta have to each other. The third thing is communications. You need to share and talk with each other. When things are not going right, you need to talk to your discipling partners or you need to talk to some other couples in the church, okay? Communications is very important. And lastly, is compromise. When you have those bumps and, and things and your arguments, we got a great lesson from uh, Patrick and Rita about resolution of, con of uh, conflicts. Remember, the important thing about re resolving conflicts it's about resolution, not about winning. Because you may win the battle, but lose the war. So compromise has to be an important part of your resolution uh, for your marriage. That's all I have. Um, I don't know if we have Get any tickets out. your tickets out we're going to give this away we would like you to put this above your bedroom door or somewhere wherever you want in the house okay <laughs> all right uh, the ticket number the last last four digits are zero seven four five <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. I don't know if we have uh, any, any questions or anything or got a couple minutes, I guess. And if we're not, we'll go always out in prayer. Dear Heavenly and Gracious Father, uh, we thank you, God, for uh, just being our God. We thank you for uh, the spouses that you have given us, God. We, we know that this is your plan. We know that you have brought uh, the people together that, that are, are together for a reason, God. And we just pray that you will continue to uh, bless our marriages, help us grow uh, as we progress through the different uh, seasons, through the different stages through the different challenges, God. And we just pray that you will uh, be there for us each and every day, and that we can uh, turn to you in our times of need, and that you have a plan for our marriage. And I pray that you would give each and every one of us a vision of that plan, God, so that we know we're following your plans and not our own will. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's his name we pray. Amen.